Get it. Uh, I'm uh, Adrian's youngest son, and um, the least likely to require counselling after public speaking. Uh, I did actually think of turning up here this morning with fainting laryngitis, just to set their reaction. Sorry, it's gone. Someone's going to have to step up, Chris. Chris. But uh, I'm not that cruel. Um, look, on behalf of my glossophobic siblings, um, I'd like to welcome you, friends and family, to celebrate the wonderful life of Adrian Kellen. Give it up for him. I did say to Dad um, only a couple of weeks ago um, that uh, if he got to his 93rd, he only needed to make one more, and then it was just a six. And he'd have made the ton. He said, that's a good plan. It didn't quite work out. Um, we've got um, a lot of family and friends here today. Firstly, thank you very much to uh, our cousins that have come from so far and wide. Um, sadly, none of Dad's siblings have bothered turning up. Um, largely because they're all dead, but... Um, this is being videoed so we can send it across to uh, um, Mum's sister Margaret in London, g'day Margie, and Mum's brother John who's uh, in Kansas City, and our next Nicky who's over in Greece, and a few others. But thank you very much to the Andersons and the Callanans, the O'Connells, uh, and the Dorneys who are probably travelling the furthest. So big round of applause for those who have travelled. Well done. Uh, as most of you would know, Mum passed away in 2008, and to be honest, Dad has not even come close to her numbers. Uh, you'd have a good eye look at yourself, Adrian. Come look at this. It was standing room only. We even had people pretending to be priests just to get an extra seat on the altar. Um, I delivered the eulogy at Mum's funeral, and Dad was very proud of that eulogy, and he would pass it around to people. Um, most of the people knew, but not always. Um, about six months after Mum passed away, I took Dad on tour with me, and uh, we got pulled over by the cops just outside of our apps, and Dad just Dad wouldn't show up. I've got this Dad, it's fine. That, no, Mum Jules, you won't help. <laughs> but, but, yep, yep, whatever. Double the very points, thanks. Um, now, Mum's eulogy, um, a good friend of mine, Tony Wilson, is a um, public speaker, author, and uh, wonderful human being. He's created a, a site called Speakola, which is a repository of speeches of all ilks, valedictories, acceptance speeches, eulogies, and he actually launched the website with Mum's eulogy. Um, and Tony has very kindly given me the stats on Mum's eulogy 3,512 reads and 52 shares. So you've got to look to live up to, Adrian. The pressure's on. Uh, now, my view is why shy away from what was already successful. It's going to draw very heavily on Mum's speech. Here we go. Adrian Kellen was the eldest daughter of Jack and May Purcell. <laughs> she attended Santa Maria Ladies College in Northcote. I might have to go off notes. Um, Probably should have edited a little bit more. <laughs> now, Adrian was known by many names to many people. Uh, some of his popular nicknames were Stringer. Um, we've never been given a satisfactory explanation as to what that, where that came from. Amy Babe is probably the most famous, given to him by our dear friend GP. He never quite threw that nickname, did you, Amy Babe? Um, Hadrian was another one, as in the Emperor and the Wall. Um, Haraji, as in the 1948 novel Cup Winner, and Age, as in the declining Fairfax publication. <laughs> Mum had a few variations on Dad's name, most famously was O Adrian. <laughs> and that was usually at times of peak frustration, um, like when they were about to go out and Dad would go to the toilet. And just to understand the depth of Mum's frustration, my father could spend a prodigious amount of time in the toilet. In 1991, he missed the next birthday, changed the federal government, and most of August. 
Most commonly, though, Mum would say Dad's name three times in increasing volume, so we'd hear Adrian, Adrian, Adrian. You're putting sugar on the salmon patties. <laughs> and sometimes she'd try and cut it. Adrian, 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 the kettle doesn't go in the fridge. But whatever you called our dad, you all loved him. He was a much loved and admired figure. And all week we've been receiving messages from people from all walks of life, ex-students, teaching colleagues, people from the Bundura Retirement Village, winemakers, uh, strangers, mainly winemakers to be honest. Um, we even got a message from the Arab police station. Dad was multi-layered. Like all quality human beings, there were many facets. He was an educator, a son, a thespian, a husband, a welfare volunteer, a granddad, a wine connoisseur, a great granddad, a confidant, a brother, an athlete, an uncle, a mentor, lover of literature and the arts, and of course, a purveyor of fashion, which reached its high point in the 1970s. Oh no, right there he is. <laughs> Look at him rocking that Bartik over shirt with pockets. <laughs> that was actually at the Cluden race course while we were visiting the Dornies up in Townsville. Uh, he also, pretty much in the 70s, made the safari suit his own. Put Don Dunstan in the shade. Uh, he made his signature look though, the walk short and walk sock ensemble. And as you'll see in the photo montage a bit later, Dad didn't mind popping a bit of a leg up in a photo either. <laughs> you know? Now there's many facets to Dad, as I said. I'm going to try and shed light on as many of those facets as I can. In this one, he's looking, he's looking a little bit monster, to be honest. And that's no coincidence, because over the last week, we've discovered in our transactions and discussions with my siblings that Dad didn't mind doing an, an underhand negotiation, of which Mum may or may not have been aware. Dad was a deal broker. Now the deals that I've heard of during the week, both Annette and Paul claim that Dad bribed them to babysit the brats, Michelle and I, on a Friday night in order to gain access to that family car on a Saturday night. Chris uh, was bribed to read more. Um, I think it was a shilling a book. I'm not sure what currency you used back in your day, but I think it was a shilling. <laughs> It didn't work, um, and it's a credit to Chris that he's carved out a 40-year career in education without being able to read a single word. <laughs> I saw him there holding a mass book before pretending it was so cute. It was upside down, mate, you know. It, yeah. Someone will help you with it, please. But I was the lucky one um, with my deal. Now, we are a mixed marriage family. Um, Mum, uh, close cousin to the great Fonz Kind was destined to break for Collingwood, and Dad, being an early adapter to perform intensive drugs, was destined to break for Essendon. <laughs> now, at the age of eight, me still trying to squeeze into the Collingwood jumper that Nana Purcell had needed for me, Dad offered me this deal. He said, If you go in for Essendon, I'll take the footy every week. I didn't break straight away. But one morning after about 18 months, I woke up and I'd shed my black and white striped skin. And I was all black with a sash. Immediately, my teeth stopped aching. <laughs> my vocab improved. <laughs> and I stopped spitting at strangers. <laughs> Paul was gutted. You know, Chris was already on the side with Essendon and he knew he was destined to a life of going to footy on his own. Unfortunately, he didn't have the vocabulary to, to articulate his pain. He just kind of spat at us from time to time. <laughs> Dad was also an athlete of some renown. That, that's the Brunswick Flash, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Dad excelled at sport. Uh, at Parade College, he was a member of the first day of the football team, the first 11 cricket team, and the athletic team, as were Chris and I. Um, Paul also attended Parade College. <laughs> Not fair. He was the Ducks of Latin. His, his ability to speak a dead language is me. <laughs> so the soul is still. 
The, the post-school years is where Dad's sporting life came to life. Uh, his stories became a little bit more epic. Now, most famously, Dad, in Backers March, one night he, after one of his big sessions drinking with his teachers, he woke up with a massive hangover. And Mum cooked him a big plate of porridge, and he went out that day and he kicked a bag of eight goals from seven and forward. One of those goals was famously reported under the headline of the local newspaper, the goal that Kellerman kicked. And depending on how drunk it was, and Dad told the story that the distance of that goal grew longer and longer every time. But the one story that we used to, we used to ask Dad to tell this almost out of habit because the facts and accuracies just seemed to grow with each one. Now Dad was an athlete, as you can see there, the Brunswick Foundation. He was participating for East Brunswick YCW in the grand final. At the end of the meet, scores were level. And then, as a deadlock, they decided to get the best athlete from each team to perform in a one-off. The event they chose, the 300 metres. <laughs> yeah, not one of the more well-known <laughs> events. Apparently they considered the uh, between the legs javelin and the backwards triple jump, but <laughs> settled on the 300 metres. Now, Dad put his hand up for this. As it turned out, that was Dad's pet event. Who could have known? <laughs> he dedicated his entire young life to being good at an event that was not included on any meet ever. <laughs> Dad settled down the blocks, he took off, and the pig ends on his stomach kicked in, and he rocked to victory. Not sure exactly by how far, but every time the distance between him and the last next competitor got a glass can of about 360 metres. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, meet Airman 80 Bay. Ooh. I think it was running one of your friends saw that picture and went, oh, who's the hot guy? That's my granddad. <laughs> <laughs> Leading aircraftman 116548, enlisted July 31st, 1942, discharged September 15th, 1945. This is probably the version of Dad we know the least. Um, he joined the raft in the footsteps of his brother, Uncle Tony, who was already uh, serving as a navigator in Lancaster in the European theatre. Dad um, tried to join as a pilot, but uh, due to an inner ear condition and testing positive to peptides, <laughs> he was uh, given the job as radar operator. He served in Darwin and the African Tablelands. We know very little of his service, but we did find his service record this week. Um, and he was A, rated, a very good character, B, ranked A class in trade proficiency, and he was wounded in action. Now, the fact that he could barely change a light bulb in civilian life, the wonder was he wasn't electrocuted more often. <laughs> Too soon? <laughs> this is Adrian Kellerman, Kellerman the Thespian. <laughs> that is Dad performing, as it just says it in Hannah on the top, a character in Molière's Tartuffe in 1948. Dad took great delight in telling a story of. Um, the day he met Mum, their mutual friend Tom Duffy took Mum to watch East Brunswick YCW playing footy. She met Dad after the game. Dad took a shine to her and wanted to ask her out, but didn't know where to ask her. And on a whim, he invited her to go and see him perform in a play the following week. The name of that play, and he loved telling the story, was He Was Born Gay <laughs> by Auburn Wall. And if Mum had a Seen that photo, I doubt that that date would ever be <laughs> Back in the 1940s, Dad started a group called the Cardinian Players with the likes of Ron Conway, famed author and sociologist, and Tony Coburn, who went on to be the director of Patrol Boats on UK television. Dad, Mum said that whenever they went to a country town um, to live, if there wasn't a repertory group, Dad would start one. And Mum would faithfully go alongside making the costumes, hosting the rap parties and setting up the trundle beds so she could sleep through his snoring. <laughs> his passion for theatre spilled over when he, even when he retired and um, became principal, he still directed the school musicals. Uh, and when he retired, he joined the Hollywood Theatre Company um, where he performed in such places as Romeo and Juliet alongside so John Gilgood and don't do your dance. Just saying if you're still listening. <laughs> I never got to perform with Dad, 
but uh, David, uh, Paul's son, uh, did. They did a rehearsed play ready together uh, at a Hardwick Theatre Company, and just quietly, Dave blew me off the step. <laughs> <laughs> Dad's funeral. <laughs> Dad was also, as many know, a self styled Somalia. Here he is, he never let go of that ball of grange all night. <laughs> now, for a man who couldn't so much as cook a single leaf of it, single leaf set of, well, that was going to be a cracker, and I've stumbled it. For a man who couldn't even cook a single leaf of it, <laughs> <laughs> bang, move on. Uh, Adrian loved hosting dinner parties. Um, however, mum's, you know, uh, culinary skills and his wine skills, they, they, together they made a pretty good match. You know, she was Margaret Fulton, he's Lane Evans, and it worked. Mum would buzz around the kitchen preparing the feast, and dad would whip around behind her, washing up and putting away all the things she didn't want washed up or put away. <laughs> and then she'd send him, um, send him, but packing down the corridor where he prepared to the linen closet where he would select the wines for the night. Now this process could take so long, you could swear he was in the toilet. <laughs> he would consult his wine scrapbooks and wine magazines, he'd light his pino infused candle at the James Halliday altar, he'd set up the wines on the buffet to decant. Then they would lock the wine and the food in their dinner party jail, I'm not joking. <laughs> and they'd sacrifice the virgin, preferably from Bordeaux. <laughs> then they'd do the cheese board. <laughs> then, of course, there's Dad, the teacher and principal. That's Dad just before he started work at his first principal gig at Greenwood High School. Dad flirted with a career on the stage, but he was born to be a teacher and he was a bloody good one. Former students would regularly get in contact with Dad years down the track and tell him that somewhere at some point he'd activated the thing that led to them achieving their dream. On Friday, we sat down with Gabriel Walsh, the funeral director, and out of the blue she said, just a week ago I had a conversation with a, a guy not known to us, and this guy had said, you know who made me who I am today? Adrian Callanan. And the story went that while at Greenwood High, this kid was a habitual truant, and Dad used to go around to his house and plea bargain with him, the deal breaker again, and say, look, just come three days a week, two days a week. He started coming for a little while, then the attendance dropped away. Dad went and got him, brought him back to the school, and he said, right, this isn't working out. Build a shed. And he did. He built a shed. Dad organised to supply the materials, and it was a bloody good shed. That man now is a builder and developer. Bruno Grohl? <laughs> Can't remember the name. No, his name was Rodney. But that says a lot about Dad. He was a champion of the underdog. At Warrigal High School, he started a thing called the Bush Academy. Ken Rigby, I'm not sure if you heard or remember the Bush Academy. But basically young, illiterate men, kids who weren't going to school, Dad got them together and taught them English. And one of those was Athel Kelly again, I'm not sure if Athel made it today, but he went on to become the chairman of the ACC and own um, Frenchie's Restaurant, which we never got enough free feeds at <laughs> for the work Dad did. We have a few of his colleagues here at Aikens, I can see, and Ian here. I'm not sure if Geraldine Sullivan made it, but we're really pleased to have his colleagues with us. Now, it wasn't just them who were esteemed Dad. I've actually got some of his education department reviews. I'm going to just read a couple of them quickly. Back as much high school, 1955. A brisk and vigorous teacher presents lessons clearly with good use of questioning and blackboard. <laughs> Warrigal High School, a very sincere and thorough and capable teacher. I'll skip forward to Oak Park, Alfred Strathmore, to Greenwood High School. Adrian Callanan deserves a sainthood for lasting a single term, let alone five years at this school. <laughs> when I walked in, I have never seen such a feral bunch of long-haired, unemployable layabouts. And that was just the staff room. <laughs> Those teachers are so left-wing, they make Lennon look like Bob Menzies. I'd burn the place down and start again, but most likely one of them will fall asleep at their desk with a split in their hands and do it for us. 
Thankfully, Adrian's been able to take refuge from the carnage in a rather good shed built at the rear of the school. <laughs> and then most importantly, Adrian Cullinan, the dad and husband. You thought he was good at the other stuff. He was world class here. We all had very close relationships with Dad in different ways. Um, and in recent times, we've all fulfilled our role, Paul and I have been extraordinary how much time they spent looking after Dad. And we all do our bit, but I asked everyone during the week just to recall something from early in Dad's life. So I'll just go through. Uh, Annette recalled Dad finding her knickers in his briefcase at a staff meeting at Back to High School. Michelle remembers getting trinkets from Dad when he came home from night school. Chris recalls hearing Dad singing or wishing happy birthday through the speakers of our radiogram. Paul recalls Dad's poor attempts at leg spin bowling in the backyard. He was a wicked keeper, so he's up. And I, of course, remember his face through the glass at the line-up of the orphanage. <laughs> And the love story of Adrian and Kathleen reads like an old school Hollywood romance that keeps going well beyond the credits. Their post war courtship is Jean Kelly and Catherine Grayson in Anchors Away. Their country years, Eva Gabor and Eddie Epson in Green Acres. Their burgeoning family, Jean Crane and Clifton Webb in Cheshire by the Dozen, and of course their doted John Golden Pond with Henry Fonda and Catherine Hepburn. But no, no Hollywood screenwriter would have concocted the cruel twist that ended their beautiful 61 year relationship. The unfathomably sad circumstances that took them apart would have broken the lesser man. But to his credit, he had every right to wallow in self pity, but he didn't. He picked himself up, and rather than us losing both parents to the same tragedy, he held his head high and moved on away from the woman he adored and who adored him. The moment I saw him apologise to Mum as she, her life ebbed away is the single most beautiful, loving thing I've ever seen. Annette. <laughs> When Dad retired, Mum and he entered one of the happiest phases of their life. And they used to, uh, the school principal hadn't quite receded, and they used to schedule a staff meeting every Monday morning. I'm not joking, 10 a.m. every Monday morning. Um, sadly, they ended when Mum passed away, but I've got on good authority, but this Monday passed, those staff meetings have been reconvened. And I've got the minutes written by Mum from the staff meeting Minutes, Kathleen and Adrian Callanan, Monday staff meeting, July 3rd, 2017. Present, Kathleen and Adrian. Apologies, none. Order of business, join West Pearly Gates Beef and Burgundy Club. Locate the nearest Dan Murphy. Jack Cooper to take Adrian to join the Kingdom Come Abner Theatre Company. Get hearing aid batteries. Speak to Dr O'Shea about Adrian's BS. I've told him that stuff doesn't matter anymore, but he won't be dissuaded. Decide on a menu for dinner party with Joan Kernan, Gay, Laurie, Tony and Nancy. Thinking of Kaisi, Mee and Pavlova. <laughs> and Scott, Frank and Laurie. Adrian's keen to buy a new car. Have managed to put that off for the time being. <laughs> um, I wrote this reflection the other night on Facebook, the day after Dad died, and it sums up the best uh, my relationship with Dad, so I'll read it again here now. Good call. <laughs> the last drizzle of colour cascaded from midair, only to disappear in less impressive drifts of smoke. Horns from boats on the harbour and distant cheers replaced the cacophony of the pyrotechnics and were able to resume our conversation. The sufferer's hangover lingered as I stood on the balcony and detailed the magic of my night thus far. He hung off my every word. In much the way I had done when he read to me of a night in my childhood bed. 
I love the longer narratives of Arthur Conan Doyle and the word plays of Bennett Surf, but it was the magical words of fairies conjured by W.B. Yeats and the canny lasses of Robbie Burns that had me clutching my spare pillow and sitting upright. The accents and oratorial poise he summoned seemed to take me directly to fog-shrouded aisles and moonlit cornrows. I love those nights. But on this night, the nights, the roles were reversed. The noise and clatter of the Sydney New Year's Eve faded in the background as I spoke to him on the balcony of the Opera House amidst the revellers whose post-operatic party we had crashed. Still in the glow of a preview performance of the complete works of Shakespeare abridged in the Playhouse, the English literature teacher in him swooned at descriptions of analysing the bard's text in rehearsal. The actor in him delighted in hearing tales of my improvisations and the father in him swelled with pride. It remains the most profoundly happy conversation of my life. He gushed with envy and told me how much an impact his, I told him how much an impact his passion for literature and theatre had fundamentally shaped who I am. And his last words on that night were, I'm so proud of you. A couple of nights ago, in a lucid moment amidst fits of delirium, I held both his hands and his eyes locked into mine, and he said it again. Now his last words. Farewell, Adrian. If we do meet again, we shall smile. If not, then the party was well made. And I just want to finish with one more thing. Dad and I uh, particularly shared a love of Robbie Burns, and I'll see how far I get. But in recent times, I used to read it too. Um, and it was incredible, even though his memory was refraining at the edges, he'd pick up on the chorus, the chorus with me. So we'll see how we go. Twas upon a lunar snake when corn rigs are bonny, beneath the moon's unclouded light, I hold away with Annie. A tiny flew by with tempest heat between the late and early. With right good will, I laid her down amongst the rigs of barley. Corn rigs and barley rigs and corn rigs bonny. I'll never forget that happy night amongst the rigs with Annie. The sky was blue, the wind was still, the moon was shining clearly. I set her down with right good will amongst the rigs of barley. I kent her heart was my own, I loved her most sincerely. I kissed her over and over again amongst the rigs of barley. I walked her in a fond embrace. My heart was beating early. Oh, my blessings on that happy place around the rigs of barley. The bay of the moon star so bright that shone that hour so clearly. Yeah, I shall bless that happy night amongst the rigs of barley. Corn rigs and barley rigs and corn rigs of barley. I'll never forget that happy night amongst the rigs of barley.